Did you ask for this room? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I think this is this is very where yeah. the room. Uh, I've never been to the Gold Goldsmith Park. Really? I tried once, I couldn't find a room. Because it doesn't say auditorium, you know? Sure. You've really never been to any of all the lectures that take place in this room? No, not one. <laughs> Freedom, 
So there's a strong sense of free enterprise, but also there's the sense of, well, when we have had, when, the, when certain actors uh, gouge prices and kind of play around with the, with the market in an unregulated way, then uh, basically everyone suffers. And that was kind of the, uh, the history pre-revolution that kind of led into this, this, this thinking that Americans had to sort out. Um, and just kind of, again, to reiterate the importance of, of markets kind of in the early American cities, one market historian said that uh, at that time, Public markets were the most visible proof of government's commitment to the well-being of the community. So, your market sucks, your community sucks. Uh, so, there was a pretty good reason for government wanting to kind of limit unregulated activity outside of the market. And uh, that took the form of three pernicious practices, as, they, as this historian called it. Uh, and these three practices are forestalling, regrading, and engrossing. Forestalling was go kind of catching the uh, the wagons on their way to market, buying up everything they have or a lot of what they had, and then reselling it somewhere outside of the market. And then there was regrading, which was basically buying up everything that a farmer had to offer during market hours storing it and then selling it after the after the market had closed. And then engrossing, which is basically a extreme version of forestalling, where um, people would buy up uh, all the products that a, a given farmer had to had to sell on the way to market and then they would store it in a, a cellar or kind of a hidden space in a dock or whatever. And over weeks, they would just kind of build up this supply, build up the supply, until the price of whatever it was, let's say it's potatoes, until that price got so high that they could sell it for something like five times its normal price. Um, and obviously this, this posed a number of problems, uh, primarily in terms of health code enforcement, public health uh, was a big issue, but also in terms of kind of collecting taxes and uh, managing public commerce in any way. However, because it was the market managers and the politicians that were kind of, that had this responsibility of enforcing it, it's really hard because all this activity happens outside of the market. So I think uh, it's fair to say some of America's first spies were uh, spying on forestallers and grocers and weed graders. Um, but that was not a very effective way to, to manage it, but it was, it was a start. Um, so on the other hand, while these, these kind of, this kind of ugly trio of activities was definitely discouraged, there's also another form of kind of informal economy that was supported uh, by the kind of early post-revolution governments. Uh, so, the two examples that I, I point out here are uh, pepper pot soup, which uh, became pretty popular in Philadelphia. And basically what would happen is uh, freed former slaves, mostly women, would occupy a vacant stall after market hours, and they would bring what was called pepper pot soup, which was a concoction of peppers and uh, tripe and ox feet and other delectable ingredients. Um, and they would sell at, at, after the market, and they would sell for just a few pennies, uh, or whatever it was at that time. And the idea was this served the, the kind of poor community, and it also gave the vendor, the freed slaves, it gave them opportunity to kind of be self-sufficient and to begin to make a life, life for themselves. Um, another example is the, uh, is at the fly market in New York, where the market was kind of so built up up to a certain point that they decided to take away licenses for coffee vendors outside of the market um, in order to establish kind of brick and mortar coffee and donut joints. 
Um, however, there was one woman who had managed to support a family of three uh, just by selling coffee outside of the market. And she petitioned the city and was able to continue vending, uh, vending her coffee, even, even despite the, the regulations. So the point is, it, it's, there's some nuance here. And the government, local government, market managers and whatnot, they, they did have some sympathy for, for these, uh, these peddlers of all, of all sorts. Um, kind of on the other end of the spectrum, not really a, a sympathy play at all was, was the, uh, the phenomenon of the female huckster. And this was common at almost every market in early America where you would have uh, women who are, who've been described as uh, large and outdoorsy who would set up tables outside of the market kind of before and after market hours and they would kind of like like other the other peddlers mentioned just before they kind of sell the same stuff snacks donuts coffee um, but they were seen to kind of provide an extra service for the market and that service was security uh, so they would protect the market vendors from robbers and they would protect other women around the market from assaults and whatnot um, so they're, they played a vital role, and it wasn't just, hey, let's let them run their little business. It was like, we need them, and there's a reason. They popped up at almost every single market from New York to New Orleans. Um, and this really, kind of as with the, uh, the pepper pot peddlers and, and the uh, coffee people, this was a, a path to self-sufficiency for women at a time when there were few paths to self-sufficiency. Um, so there were examples of, of widows who were, who were able to, over the course of their lives, kind of generate a huge mass of savings just from, uh, from selling coffee and donuts. Um, my <laughs> favorite example, and I tried so hard to find a picture of her, but I just don't know that there is one, but there is at the Oswego Market in upstate New York, uh, there was a woman that, whose nickname was Large Donut, and she was said to weigh 255 pounds, and no one messed with her. So they provided security physically, like eyes on the street, sort of vigilance? I think both, I think both, but I think they're kind of uh, physically imposing oh. presence. Uh, was, was enough in many cases, but they, they would resort to physical, they had to. Um, so kind of pushing into the second half of the 19th century, we start to see the market landscape change. And by that I mean we start to see markets disappear for the, for the first time significantly. So um, as I mentioned before, Markets are kind of this this kind of urban uh, civic center at this point in history, um, and so when tensions over immigration and and, uh, and slavery came up, they often these kind of often erupted at markets. Uh, so I most have heard of the the Haymarket riot in Chicago in 1886. Uh, you may not know about the nanny goat riot in Philadelphia, or the nanny goat market riot. Either way, these riots all happened at markets, and that was, and certain politicians kind of saw it as, okay, if we get rid of the market, we can get with, rid of the unrest. Um, anyway, and, th and this is kind of when we started to see some of the rhetoric calling, calling markets slums, uh, and kind of associated with drunks and vagrants and prostitutes, and, uh, which were, quote, affronts to middle class sensibilities. Um, and then in addition to that, we kind of have a couple new innovations. It may not seem like innovations now, but uh, grocery stores began to become more viable at that time, which made markets less viable. And uh, railroads started to be built throughout the city and 
the markets, which are often kind of located along docks, uh, but get close to downtown, were seen as kind of the key areas to, through which to build a railroad or a railroad station. Um, yeah, so here we, this is a picture, it's pretty grainy, but it's a picture of the aftermath of the Nanny Goat market riot, um, where you see they're kind of surveying the, the damage and maybe thinking about what other uses they can have. Um, markets start to make a comeback in the, in the City Beautiful movement. Uh, you know, some of my peers from, uh, from the intro to, to planning know this all too well, but the City Beautiful movement is basically uh, late 1890s, and the idea behind it was that if we kind of have beautiful civic structures, uh, it can inspire society to act more morally and intelligently and whatnot. Um, and this applied directly to markets. So Daniel Burnham himself, who's seen as the founder of the City Beautiful movement, actually designed a market in Chicago. Um, and another pretty kind of more famous market from that era was the <coughs> Center Market in Washington, D.C. And here they, again, the, the kind of ethics of this, of, of this, of the city beautiful design was that you create beautiful public place, places for everyone. Uh, and that included hucksters and peddlers and kind of all these other informal, uh, informal workers. Um, so within the design of these new city beautiful markets, they would, in kind of the center area would be kind of more like bourgeoisie. Uh, they would kind of have fancy stalls. On the right here we have uh, <coughs> Ockerhausen's condiment stall from the DC center market. Um, you can tell they kind of, they have a great degree, degree of pride with their, their ties and their, and their white coats and whatnot. But then within the same market you have stalls for people like this 11 year old kid who's, who's selling, selling fruits by hand out of, out of a basket um, or for uh, these uh, hucksters that you see on, on the left here. Um, yeah, so kind of in contrast to the, uh, the rhetoric around markets as slums, we actually we start to kind of see a new, a new vision of them as place for everyone and for all types of commerce. Um, and moment, um, the designer behind this center market had a good quote that I think is worth worth mentioning. He said that this designating these stalls for hucksters outside uh, was a feature which is held in extreme importance by all owners of markets and by the public and is participated in by intelligent market men since it draws a great mass of purchasers to their business places. So he's making the argument, this is just, it's in addition to uplifting society and all these other kind of city beautiful values, it's just good business uh, to, to invite everyone and kind of make it accessible to, to all in terms of both purchasers and vendors. Um, this is kind of where the, the informal market uh, history kind of all comes to a, a crux. And this is uh, late 19th century New York, where you kind of, you first start to see the takeoff of department stores and uh, grocery stores kind of really becoming pretty popular in New York at that time. And if you were in the upper middle class at that time, you wanted to be in these nice indoor spaces. You didn't want to be out in the streets uh, at, at the market. Um, and that left behind the, the peddlers and the hucksters and uh, all these other informal vendors who remained on the streets. So in the 1880s, we see an influx of immigrants coming into New York. They're all crowding into these tenement houses in Lower Manhattan, and naturally, the uh, 
the vendors, the informal vendors, cluster in between these tenement houses and set up shop. Um, and uh, here we see another kind of uh, misdirected use of laws in managing markets. Uh, New York at the time, they kind of saw this again as kind of slum and unclean. Um, and they, they made a law that you couldn't set up a push cart stall uh, for more than 15 minutes at a time. So people would bring their push cart down to the street and then after 15 minutes, they would just scoot it over three feet and they were fine in terms of the law. Uh, so they didn't quite think that one through all the way. Um, but kind of what, what I think is important about this is that this was seen as a stepping stone for immigrants who, who kind of came to, to America without, they might have had skills, but they might not have immediately been able to find a place to practice those skills. And peddling was recommended by people who resettled these immigrants as a great way to kind of get your start in America. So uh, in the 1880s, at one point, uh, push cart peddling was the second most common profession for Jewish immigrants after uh, tailors. Um, and, then, and again, we kind of have this, while there were laws to regulate it, uh, the government did recognize that there was a there was a need, and that's why these these uh, tenement markets came out in the first place. Um, it's and it's essentially it's it's the poor serving the poor, and um, the market commissioner at the time had a quote. He said, "The fact that these markets are located in the crowded street crowd, in crowded streets in the poorest section of the city." because it's where the need for them is greatest. The push cart is the poor man's market. Tone starts to change in the early uh, 1900s. Uh, again, we, we kind of start to hear politicians talk about uh, these push cart markets as uh, kind of against what the city wants in terms of a clean, organized, uh, kind of little, little congestion, uh, kind of utopia of sorts, and the push cart was the opposite of that. So uh, we see another attempt at, at regulating the push carts. Uh, they um, were, for a while, they kind of had a, um, a neutral zone where they were allowed to pedal without, without getting fined or anything. And that was uh, under bridges throughout the city uh, that were far away from where people actually lived. Um, people didn't really come to these under the bridge markets uh, because they were inconvenient, understandably. Um, and that ultimately, that law kind of fell apart. Um, but then when World War I comes around, we have huge food shortages because we're shipping all of our food overseas. And again, there's people need, the prices of food comes up because of that, and people need cheap options. So then once again, we, we say, okay, peddlers, come back in. Uh, let's, you can, you can sell your, your, uh, your cheap snacks to those who, who need it the most. So they, they've kind of become reintegrated into the urban fabric in the uh, kind of late, teens, early 20s, um, and then Mayor LaGuardia comes around, and uh, you can probably tell from his face there, uh, he, he was not too fond of the, of the public market, or of the push guard markets. So he made uh, reform, or kind of peddling reform, his, one of his key policies. Um, and his idea of kind of ridding the city of push cart evil, which was his term, um, was basically to kind of open a new set of markets that were totally enclosed and indoors, um, and basically to offer some of the push cart peddlers an opportunity to uh, set up a formal stall within these markets. Um, however, 
before he came to power, there were 40 different push cart markets operating throughout the city, and he only opened up nine indoor markets, and only a small chunk of those nine markets was reserved for former push cart peddlers. So essentially, he didn't really give them an opportunity give them, uh, but nonetheless he was generally pretty effective in, in, uh, in doing away with, with the push cards. Um, one thing that kind of might, might have helped the PR at the time, uh, he and his market commissioner at the time, uh, the World's Fair was in New York in 1939, and this was kind of seen as a showcase of all that's good in, in city planning and innovation and whatnot. And they actually created an exhibit within the World's Fair called The Life and Death of the Pushcart Vendor. So they, they pretty much kind of said, all right, this is history. Um, okay, now as we get into the, into the middle of the 20th century, we once again kind of see a sea change in, in uh, how markets are organized, where they're placed, and, and whatnot. So, uh, Yet again, history history is repeating itself. There, there's again a huge kind of surge of rhetoric around uh, the public market being a slum where where prostitutes, drunks, vagrants, derelicts, they just want to hang out there. And if we get rid of the uh, of the public market downtown, then we can maybe these vagrants will just all disappear. Was um, in addition to that, these, these markets, which have largely uh, become obsolete in terms of their actual public service because the uh, produce was getting more expensive, you could get it in grocery stores just as easily. Um, so planners uh, and politicians and architects kind of started to see these former market spaces as prime, prime for redevelopment downtown. Um, and this is also a time when uh, with the proliferation of highways, we see, we start to see white flight, we start to see the middle class exit the city, and they kind of aspired to, by demolishing public markets and creating new spaces downtown, they thought that they could bring the middle class back downtown by getting rid of the public market. Uh, don't think that went too well. Um, but they essentially thought that the reason that uh, produce in public markets was so expensive was because it was time consuming to move food within the city and not just to get it there from the agricultural land. Uh, and this is why they designed what's called terminal markets. And here we have a picture of, of one of them. Um, and the idea was if you kind of set up a huge market as for wholesaling at the urban periphery, then you can eliminate this added charge, this kind of added cost of moving food within the city. Um, so they basically thought that they could redesign the entire urban food system around these terminal markets. Uh, however, they failed to consider that the private sector would beat them to the punch and kind of huge supermarkets would develop these relationships with farmers themselves and do it more efficiently, um, which is what ended up happening. So it was a, a good idea with these, these kind of these huge peripheral distribution centers did not, did not go too well. Um, and ironically, uh, the USDA and the Urban Land Institute, who now are, are big promoters of public markets, they, uh, they actually produced some of the key reports and presentations to Congress that uh, were kind of the death knell for, for public markets. Um, so. Anyway, Bringing it back to today, uh, so markets pretty much, they were down to just a, a few hundred after the urban renewal era uh, in, the, in the 
1970s, one uh, academic called them a, um, now I'm forgetting the term, I think she said unnecessary appendage or something like that. Um, anyway, they died, essentially, they almost died, and then markets started to come back to the point where now there's over 8,000 markets in the U.S. Um, but you don't really, you don't see the same level of, of the informal economy flourishing at these markets. Uh, and I, I don't claim to have, to know why, really, uh, but I, I have a few theories. I think one of which is that the EBT slash SNAP program has actually done a really good job of uh, making produce available for those who can't afford it. Um, so at a lot of markets, you can bring your EBT card, and they will give you these little wooden tokens, and essentially you get double dollars. So you, uh, you can get a lot of fresh produce for pretty cheap, and you don't need to look to the uh, kind of the sneaky peddler around the market because you can get what you need within there. Um, and then there's also kind of also proliferation of, of other informal markets. You have swap meets, you have uh, open air markets. So basically open air tent markets have now become the most common type of farmer's market in the US, making up over 80% of markets, uh, and that's essentially, it's a cheap, mobile, temporary option where it really doesn't cost a lot, and I can speak from experience, it doesn't cost a lot just to set up a table in the parking lot, and uh, that has been pretty much entirely accepted. So if you if you want to call that the, the informal economy, then uh, you could say that it still exists there. Um, but yeah, um, that's that's about that's about all I got. Um, I I don't really I don't claim to know where the uh, where the hucksters of today are, but I, I think that this is a, a really interesting part of history that's, that's worth thinking about, and uh, there are definitely some implications for today. I'm just sorting it. That's all. Thank y'all for coming out.
markets. But uh, another thing that, that I think is an important trend for today is we we see a lot of uh, these kind of food hall markets where they're selling prepared foods and not as much fresh produce. It's not really a farmer's market, but it's, it's a, a market nonetheless. And these are typically indoors, they're for a kind of consumer that has a decent bit of money to spend, and there's, there's really no way that an informal vendor would, would be able to make it in there. Yes, Caitlin. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the work you're doing in the medical field? Um, so what is I think I'm actually not allowed to talk about it because of uh, they had a sign an, an agreement. Uh, but I, I can speak in very general terms. Uh, yeah, we're, we're thinking about how, so this is kind of part of a hospital complex, and we're, we're thinking about how can public markets and fresh produce and healthy food be used as a, uh, like a preventative health and um, kind of how can we get doctors in the entire hospital system on board with prescribing patients to eat good, healthy food as opposed to um, kind of treating the issue once it's already come up. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think there's too much more I can say. Yes, Anne. Um, so another thing I'm very sorry about this permanent
pretty similar model to that where uh, they basically they act as a middleman. They buy all the produce from local farmers and then kind of resell it in the CSA form, but they also do this kind of uh, more informal market where they let other other vendors and prepared foods show up. Yeah. Um, is there uh, any kind of pattern of reactions more recently by grocery stores, maybe bigger chain grocery stores, as maybe the, the one of the leading competitors to this kind of pop-up market? I don't know if that's actually if they are the competitors, but do they react in some way when these happen? Uh, I in general, I, I don't think it the, the the big stores are very nervous because it's just it's such a tiny percent yeah. of overall food purchases that are at these markets. But uh, I have I so when I was farming in New Orleans, we were at a Whole Foods, um, and we initially in our plan we were going to have kind of like a little market stall outside of the Whole Foods, and they they shot that down pretty quickly. Uh, but that's that's a pretty good. Do most markets just sell food? Do no. Do you different services? No, there's usually a, a, a good mix, uh, but that that varies. But for what I'm what I'm talking about is mostly food markets. Thanks for coming out, y'all.